We're going to get into it right away this morning. And um, like we had kind of briefly mentioned last Sabbath uh, about how we're going to, this Sabbath and the following, next Sabbath, we're going to be kind of focusing more on Elul because <clears throat> we're already two weeks into it, two and a half weeks, two weeks, whatever, into Elul. But anyway, so we're going to talk about Elul again today, but we're going to talk at Elul in comparison with the first feast that is coming up, which is Yom Terura, right? Terura. Terura, <laughs> which is Yom Terura. Now, interesting, you know, we've, been, we've mentioned here and there things about Elul and saying how Elul is uh, a preparation time for the high holidays. But we're going to look at something a little bit different today that we necessarily haven't really thought of, I guess, before. But um, some ca comparisons between Elul and Yom Teruah. So when you look at Elul, and, and we're well-versed in this congregation about what Elul is, but when you look at Elul, one of the big things that we know about it is how the king is in the field. You know, Tim talked about that Tuesday night during Bible study, how the king is in the field. And it's when, a time, it's, it's when the king steps off his throne, exits the palace, and he comes into our field. Okay, we know about that. But then you look at Yom Teruah, and that's also a time when it's expected that our king is going to step off his throne, exit his heavenly kingdom, and make his return to our field. So you see the two things about Elul. It's about the king coming into the field. You see the thing about Yom Teruah. It's about the king returning, our king Yeshua. So when you look at Elul, and, and you think about it, Elul brings us right to Yom Teruah. It brings us right up to that. So in essence, Elul is preparation time for Yom Teruah. You know, we say Elul is preparation time for the high holidays. Well, it's kind of more the fact that it's preparation time for Yom Teruah. So why do I say that? Because, well, what do we know about Elul? It's, it's the most intimate time to be spending with the king. Um, it's to be he's spending time with him, fellowshipping with him. Repentance is involved in the whole thing and cleansing ourselves. Why? To be ready to encounter him on Yom Teruah. So another reason why we we're saying that, you know, Elul is preparation time for Yom Teruah. What takes place after Yom Teruah, in between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur? You have the 10 days of awe, or what they call the 10 days of repentance, which is another time of retrospect retrospection and repentance. So when you look at it like that, we have a lul that is a time of self-examination, a time when we're supposed to be repenting. Then again, you have the 10 days of awe, which is the same exact thing. So in essence, when you look at it, um, Elul is preparation time for Yom Teruah, and the 10 days of Ar are preparation time for Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And it's very important, the whole aspect of Elul <clears throat> coming into Yom Teruah. And we were talking about this, how, you know, we need to make sure we're ready. We need to make sure that we're ones with clean hands and a pure heart. But how do you get ready for something? You've got to prepare for it. But, um, before we get into that, just a couple other comparisons to look at the similarities between Elul and Yom Teruah. One of the things that we're supposed to be doing every single morning during Elul is blowing the shofar. That is set for Elul. We're supposed to be blowing the shofar every single morning. Well, what is Yom Teruah about? It's also called the Festival of Trumpets. And on Yom Teruah, you blow the shofar, a hundred times. So you have a lul that has the shofar being sounded, and then you have Yom Tura, which has the sound of the shofar. And one of the things that we know about the sound of the shofar, it's an alarm, it's a wake up call, uh, it's meant to be for a battle cry. But another thing with the sound of the shofar is, is when is, there's the coronation of the king. So when you look at these comparisons, is Elul and Yom Teruah. Elul is because the king is coming, and Yom Teruah is because the king is coming. The two almost go like hand in hand, so to speak. So with that being said, um, 
Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to talk about preparation time, but we're also going to talk about being ready. And we know this parable very well. But in Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, thoughtless without foresight, and five were wise, intelligent and prudent. But when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil along with them, with their lamps. While the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and they fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy for yourselves. But while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. I am not acquainted with you. Then verse 13, watch therefore. Give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Now, those five foolish virgins had the door shut on them. Why? Because they were not prepared. They were not properly prepared, and they missed the biggest encounter that they could have had with the bridegroom. But verse 13 is vital because he says, watch therefore. We need to be watching. We need to be aware. We need to be paying attention. You know, in verse 12, those are pretty serious words to to hear from the Lord. You know, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. And he said that to them because they weren't prepared. They weren't prepared for the things to come. So interesting, Um, after I'd been looking at all this and stuff, this thing came up on my phone. And uh, they were talking about the very same thing, the parable of the ten virgins. And I was like, wow, this actually goes along perfectly because I'd already been uh, thinking about and meditating on the fact of being prepared and being ready. But they they said some uh, interesting key lessons about the parable of the ten virgins. And the first one was, be prepared for Yeshua's return. The main theme of the parable is the importance of being prepared for the return of Yeshua. The wise virgin had oil for their lamps, symbolizing their readiness, while the foolish ones did not, representing a lack of preparation. The second one was personal responsibility. The parable emphasizes personal responsibility in your relationship with Yahweh. The wise virgins could not share their oil with the foolish ones, indicating that each person must be responsible for their own spiritual preparation. No one can rely on someone else's relationship with Yahweh. And then the third one was avoid neglect. The foolish virgin's failure to prepare led to them being shut out of the wedding feast, symbolizing the consequences of not being ready for when Yeshua returns. The exact time of Yeshua's return is unknown, so us as as believers, we need to stay ready and be prepared. Well, how do you go about doing something like that? Now, interesting, I'm actually going to kind of get ahead of myself but if you, go, if you go back into Matthew chapter 24, you know, he gives, us, he gives us things to do along the way. He helps us to prepare. He tells us, do this. If you do this, then you'll be ready. Make sure, you, you know, that's why he gives us commands. So in Matthew 24, verse 42, very similar, he said, watch therefore, give strict attention, be cautious and active, for you don't know in what kind of a day your Lord is coming. And verse 44 says, you also must be ready therefore, for the son, is, son of man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. 
So we need to always be ready. We don't know the, the time or the day that we, he's coming, but we do know he's coming. And many, many, you know, prophecies, many teachers and scholars and stuff really firmly believe that he is coming on Yom Teruah. And there's, there's scripture to back it up when you have the different scriptures that talk about the blowing of the shofar and how you hear our king coming when the shofar sounds and all this different stuff. But we need to make sure that we are ready so we don't miss him coming whenever he comes. So in part to do that, you got to prepare. In order to be ready, you have got to prepare. You just can't wake up one morning and be like, well, I'm ready, if there's been no preparation behind getting ready. So what does the word prepare mean? Prepare means to make something ready for use. Make someone ready or able to do or deal with something. Prepare means to be ready. It means to make ready beforehand. So in order to be ready for something, you have to prepare before the event takes place. So, you know, think about it, different examples of that. Like when you're going to take a trip. Well, you got to think about well, how you're going to go there. Are you going to drive? If you're going to drive, you've got to map out, map out the route that you're going to take. You just don't want to wait until that morning when you're leaving and be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to take a, you know, a, a trip now and have to figure out that morning when you're supposed to leave what route you're going to take to get to your destination. So if you're going to drive, you've got to plan out the route. If you're going to fly, you've got to plan on how, you know, what flight are you going to take, what time are you going to leave. Are you going to leave out of this airport or leave out of this airport? You've got to take, get tickets. You know, what are you going to be bringing? When you go on a trip, depending on the trip, there's specific things that you might need to bring. So like we were talking about this yesterday, you know, when we all used to go to Haiti. And part of the preparation time to go to Haiti, and we did it for Israel too, but more of the focus of it was on Haiti. Mom used to say to us, two, three weeks before you're leaving for Haiti, make sure you're drinking a lot of water. Drink a lot of water so your body is already hydrated. It's already prepared and you're doing the preparation so that you already be ready for when you're in Haiti and you're encountering the heat and the hard work in that heat. You've already made your body ready to, to deal with those situations. So you prepared beforehand. And, and, you know, some of us drank multiple bottles of water every single day. We prepared to make sure we were ready Take for that vitamins. trip to Haiti. Take your vitamins. Make sure you're building up your immune system. So you, you know, do all stuff like that. You get yourself, you prepare so that you get yourself ready for the time of the event. You know, another example, and this is actually a big one, but it, it, it matches with what we're talking about. You know, come on, we're talking about the bridegroom and we're talking about, you know, when, you, when, when Yeshua returns and there's going to be a wedding feast and stuff. Well, in the natural, a wedding, you've got to prepare for a wedding. There's specific plans that you have got to make for a wedding. It's all this preparation time. You know, I remember when Scott and I were planning for ours, long time ago, but you know, it wasn't just, we decided, you know, we woke up one morning and decided we were going to get married the next day. It actually took months to plan our wedding. So, you know, you look at, to, to prepare for it. So you look at, okay, well, how many, how many bridesmaids was I going to have and who were going to be my bridesmaids? Who are going to be my maid of honor? You know, who was going to be his best man and his ushers? You know, what were the colors going to be? Uh, what flowers, what kind of flowers were we going to have? What kind of cake were we going to do? Where were we going to have it? Okay, where were we going to have the, the wedding ceremony? Where were we going to have the reception? All these plans, this preparation time, which took months, you know, it took months to do. I think it was a, it was like a year before our actual date that we sent, set. We spent that year make, you know, preparing, having preparations for when that day came. Even down to the smallest things, it's like, okay, well, we're going to get a limo, and the limo's going to take us from the, the church to the reception hall. Now, you should be prepared for all things, but just on a side note, one of the things Scott and I weren't prepared for on that day is when our limo driver was taking us from the church to the reception hall and um, got lost, and we ended up 
really neither one of us, and we know New Hampshire fairly well that part, neither one of us knew where we were, and the limo driver is just flying through these back roads and up and down hills, and, and he made us considerably late for our wedding. We actually had people trying to uh, find where we were. In fact, we were so late, and we weren't prepared for this, but we were so late that his best man um, got into our car and came back searching for us because they were like, what happened back then? Back then, there were no cell phones or anything like that. <laughs> kind of dating it here but you know there were no cell phones or anything like that so everybody was like everyone else was at our reception waiting <laughs> and now people are like okay so where's the bride, the bride and groom <laughs> they have not it's been an hour okay it's been an hour and a half okay what is going on okay and uh, I just remember the limo driver calling back to his base being like or, or contacting somebody somehow I don't even remember how it happened I think he pulled over somewhere to use a phone and finally, huh? He had a car phone? Oh, so maybe they had car phones. Yeah. And I had to call back to the base to find out how in the world to get us to where we were going. And finally, I mean, I think we were actually like two hours late for our own wedding reception. But hey, you know, hallelujah. But <laughs> it was a time where it took, you know, a lot of preparation to get ready for that one big day. Well... We have a lot of preparation to do to get ready for this one big day that is coming up with Yom Tarura. And you know, it might, it might be a challenge if you're a person that likes to live life by the seat of your pants, you know, like wake up one day and be spontaneous, I'm just gonna go on and go on a trip, but you can't live life like that. You know, in, in the serious matters of life, you gotta take the time to prepare. You gotta take the time to get ready for it. And not just wake up and, oh, okay, we're going to go and go to Israel today. No, that's, you, you want to prepare for something like that. You, wanna, you want the time leading up to it to, to get ready. So that was being prepared, but to be ready. And that's the, that's the point we want to get it to. We want to make sure we're ready. You know, we don't want to be like the five foolish virgins. When the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords returns, and the door gets shut on us because we weren't prepared. We weren't ready to have him come and return. You know, mom was talking to me the other day, and you know, we've heard this before, and it's like, you need to live your life every day like he's returning that day. You know, we don't know, like I said, we don't know when he's coming, but we need to be living, we need to be living today like he's coming today. We need to live tomorrow like he's coming tomorrow. We need to be living like he's coming back, and we don't want to be the ones left behind. That's why he gives us these times to, to prepare and get ready so that we're where we need to be, so that when our king returns, he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. I find you with clean hands and a pure heart, and, and, and we're not left behind. And that's not a time when you want to be even one minute late. You know, even if you're one minute late, then you miss the boat. I've read people who, who have missed their cruise ships because cruise ships are strict about, okay, when, when we say we're leaving at 6 o'clock p.m., we're leaving at 6, 6 o'clock p.m. Whoever's on the boat is on the boat. If you're back in port and you're running after the cruise ship, they're not going to turn around and go back for you. Um, you know, the, there was probably a lot of people in the day of Noah that realized as the water started to rise, oh, we should have listened to Noah, but it was too late. The door had been shut. You don't want to be caught in a time in a position where the door's shut, where the, you've had all this time to get ready. You've had all this time to change. And suddenly the day of reckoning is at hand. So the word ready, the word ready means to be fully prepared means in a suitable state for an activity, action, or situation, and it means to be easily available. So that's how we need to be when the king returns. What, no, you know, where, whenever it is, but we need to be fully prepared and easily available so that we're in position to be able to go with him. Um, uh, another translation that I wanted to read from Matthew 24 that I had just read about, watch therefore, for you don't know the day your Lord is coming. 
Another translation says, so always be ready because you don't know the day your Lord will come. So it says right there in the word, always be ready. Don't be caught off guard. Make sure you're always, re always ready so that you will be in position for when he comes back. Um, so I just wanted to read this article that I happened to come across, and it's called The Importance of Being Prepared. And it says, being prepared is important whether one is walking 100 miles in a week or training for a mass challenge bike, bike race. Uh, Yeshua says being prepared is also very important for living the Christian life while we wait for his return. As he often does, he teaches about the importance of being prepared in the parable. It is the case in Matthew 25, what I just read, 1 through 13. It says the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids is like an anxiety dream for followers of Yeshua about his return. The parable is a strong reminder of the importance of readiness, of being prepared at all times for the second coming of Yeshua. In a way, the parable is a lesson about the value of prepper, prepare, prep, bleh, how do I say it? Prepper, what's that word? Preparedness. Prepar preparedness over planning when it comes to the future. The wise virgins get to go to the party because they are prepared. They have the needed oil. The others had a plan. Let's go buy some oil. They missed the party. The biblical approach to the future involves prayer and preparation, more than prediction and planning. So if you think about it, you go to the beach and the wind is up and you see surfers catching the waves. Folks who truly love to surf basically do everything else in life that they have to do just so they can get back to the water. Surfers don't plan waves. They prepare to ride them when they roll in. I thought that was an interesting, interesting comment. But... um. Throughout, um, actually, I'm skipping around in here because I didn't want to read the whole thing. So let's think about the surfers again. They wax their boards, monitor the weather, and get up early. They do everything in their power to be prepared to ride the waves. But the wind and the waves are totally out of their control. Now think about it. You can have a plan to ride to get through the storm, but if, you don't, if you're not prepared to ride through the storm then it's not going to do you any good. Throughout the Bible, we see Yahweh's desire for people to pray and prepare for the Lord's intervention. The Bible doesn't say much positively about people making plans and then offering to him for a divine blessing. But whatever it is, we need to discern the purpose of the Lord for our lives and for our, our futures. In our own lives, we want to do everything we can to discover his purpose for them. We want to be prepared praying and preparing for his intervention and action so we're ready to ride the wave of what Yahweh is doing in the world and in our life. In Genesis 12, God told Abram to begin a journey and didn't even tell him where he was going. Abram couldn't plan the itinerary. All he could do was prepare by telling his family, wrapping us up business details, and packing his tent and setting out. The exodus from Egypt is a story of prayer and preparation. Yahweh planned the exodus, no person could. No one, no one would have written the story Yahweh did, and Moses didn't get to see the whole plan ahead of time. The Israelites prepared by marking their doors, taking everything they could carry, and waiting for the word to, for the word to move out. John the Baptist preached saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He didn't say, plan the way of the Lord. Preparing involves calling upon the Lord, coming to him in relationship, praying, seeking him with all our heart. Our faith is not one more item on a to-do list. Our faith forms our to-be and to-do list. Throughout Matthew's gospel, Yeshua teaches people about living and growing in relationship with Yahweh. Yeshua stresses that being spiritually alive, alive means not just knowing religious information or even saying we believe certain doctrines, but doing what Yeshua teaches regarding love for Yahweh and their neighbor. Right at the beginning of the parable, Yeshua tells us that the five of the virgins were foolish and five are wise. We can't tell that just by looking at them. All ten have come for the wedding. All ten have their lamps lit in expectation. 
all ten presumably have on their bridesmaids' gowns, would never guess initially from appearances that half are foolish and half are wise. It's not the looks, the lamps, or the long dresses that sets the wise apart from the foolish. It's the readiness. Five of the virgins are ready if the groom is delayed, and five are not. The wise have enough oil for the wedding to start whenever the groom arrives. The foolish only have enough for their own timetable. Now catch that. That's just kind of like a say law, okay? They have enough for their own timetable. Five are prepared and ready, even for a delay, five are not. Readiness in Matthew's gospel is about living the life of the kingdom, living the quality of life described in the Sermon on the Mount. Many can do this briefly or in spurts, but when the kingdom is delayed, when it takes longer for things to happen than, like, than we'd, we'd like or hope, then that's when we start to bring challenges on ourselves. The, the virgins who got shut out represent irresponsible disciples who simply weren't prepared for Yahweh's intervention. Their promise is not, their challenge is not that they were sleeping, the wise virgins were also asleep. Being watchful means being ready at all times, whether we're awake or sleeping. The wise virgins were captured by a vision of the importance of the bridegroom's visit. Get that. We have got to be captured by the vision of the return of our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We've got to be captured by the vision of what a lul means and what a lul means to bring us up to be ready for Yom Teruah. Their values are demonstrated in what they do. They not only bring their lamps, they bring flasks of oil as well. Values are demonstrated by behavior. For Matthew, readiness means living in the quality of life described in the Sermon on the Mount and throughout his gospel. Being ready involves the performance of good works, abstinence from bad behavior, love for enemies, love for other Christians, the forgiveness of others, unhesitating faith, loyalty to Yeshua, and loyalty for Yahweh. This is Yahweh's plan for our life, which when followed leads to the love, joy, peace, and hope which so many of us are seeking. So when you think of whenever you have guests come over, most of us want to be prepared and ready. How would you respond if your relatives and friends just showed up without letting you know they were coming? We want to be prepared for guests, whether family or special friends, because frankly, we don't want to be embarrassed. When we have people over, we are driven to pick up, clean, dust, and vacuum because we're concerned about what people will think about our physical living space and how we think that reflects on us. I'm not saying that is a bad thing. Part of hospitality is creating a nice space for people in their, our lives and our living space. But what would it look like if we cleaned up our lives because Yeshua was coming with the same urgency that we clean our homes because some friends or relatives were visiting. At the beginning of the journey of faith, you can't really tell the followers of Yeshua apart. They all have lamps. They're all excited about the wedding. They all know how to sing Lord, Lord. The longer the journey of faith, the later at night it gets. The clearer it becomes who is wise and who is foolish, who is prepared and who is coming with their own plans, who is ready to ride the wave of Yahweh's intervention in action and who will be left standing on the beach? Who will be invited into the wedding banquet? And who will be shocked to discover that they have been shut out regardless of their claiming the right confession of faith? As followers of Yeshua, we are, in the language of the parable, to be like the wise virgins who are ready at any time to respond to the call of the Lord. That's what this is all about. And this is the time that we have being in the lul. These last, last, you know, couple of weeks that we have, <clears throat> don't, don't waste them. You know, you may find yourself, you've come through these first two weeks and you haven't really done much, haven't really taken things seriously. Well, you still have two weeks to take things seriously, to get on the right track, to do the preparations to make sure that you're ready. You do the necessary preparations now to get ready and stay ready for when we come into Yom Turah.
and we'll be in position. You know, something that, that goes parallel with staying ready, with being ready, is being alert. You know, you can't really be ready for something that's coming if you're not alert. Um, you know, Ephesians 6, um, you know, we know about the armor of God. It talks about the armor of God. At the end of it, in verse 17 and 18, it says, Take the helmet of, of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So be alert. Um, you know, she was reading in, in, um, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, it says, all of you must keep awake, give strict attention, be cautious and active, and watch and pray that you may not come into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, when it comes down to it, the only reason why we're not prepared for things is our flesh gets in the way. We all have flesh, it all gets in, it gets in the way. If we allow our, the voice of our flesh to be louder than the voice of our spirit, louder than the word, louder than Holy Spirit within us, then it's always going to put us into a place where we're not prepared for the enemy's attacks, where we're not ready for Yahweh moving. Um, so we got to make sure that we are, you know, we talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago about praying in the spirit and, and how all the more as we are getting closer to that day, we need to be building ourselves up on our most holy faith. Praying in the spirit is vital. It's, it's your connection to Yahweh. And it's also speaking things out and declaring things in such a way that the enemy can't, can't mess it up. The enemy can't, can't put his hand in there. But <clears throat> Yahweh wants to be able to work through us in these days. You know, he wants us to be vessels that he can use, that he can, he can work through to touch people, to impact this world. But if we're not even aware that we're, that we are in a battlefield, that, that we're not, this isn't, life isn't a playground where it's a battle, battlefield. If we're not aware of that, then the enemy can have a lot more occasions to trip us up. Um, you know, uh, we're hearing all these things about Israel, but Israel has to constantly be on alert. They can't let their guard down for an instant. The instant they let their guard down, they have enemies all around us. We saw that on October 7th, right? October 7th was Israel being caught off guard, being caught not alert and not ready for the tactic of the enemy. Um, and the Fogel family, we all know about the Fogel family back in 2011. When you look at the events surrounding both of these attacks, now October 7th was many, many Fogel families, um, but the events surrounding those is that the nation began to, the communities began to rely too much on technology and their smart fences. So they let their guard down and they weren't watching. Um, that the enemy can override technology, but if there's people who are watching and alert, it's a lot harder to override that. So in a battle zone, there's always going to be traps. There's always going to be ambushes that the enemy has set up. You know, um, for, uh, in, in Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 8, talks about how the enemy is prowling around like a lion seeking whom he can devour. He's looking for an opening. He's looking for an opportunity. But who is he not able to devour? Those who are alert and aware of his, of his tactics. If you're watching the enemy coming up over a hill, he's not going to catch you off guard and be able to sneak in an ambush on you. As a matter of fact, if you know his plot, you know, Israel's good at finding out the plots of the enemy ahead of time. And they say, oh, well, this, this terrorist here was planning to, to carry out this terrorist attack over here, but they catch him over here before he's even able to get near it. If you can stop it out there, then there's a lot less um, debris, a lot less casualties that you have to clean up afterwards. You want to keep the enemy out. You don't want to let him be getting in. But that all comes down to alertness. Now, it's interesting because when it says that the enemy is prowling around like a lion roaring, roaring in hunger, seeking whom he can devour, um, in the natural realm, just in talking about lions, 
Um, it's the oldest and weakest lions that do the roaring. The young lions don't go around roaring. They hide. They hide in, in secret, and they wait until the last minute to, to be able to spring on their prey. They don't go around roaring at the prey, because when the prey hears the roar, they're going to get out of the way. So if the enemy is walking around roaring like a lion, then you know where he is. And it's giving you a clue, okay, he's, he's circling around the camp trying to find a way in. Um, when the enemy is active, the enemy is active all the time now. He's always trying to catch us off guard. He's, trying to, he's always going to be trying to get us to head into a trap. And he's always going to be trying to get us to fall into some sin or fall into something and get us to lose ground. We have to be spiritually alert at all times. Um, and if, we, if we're staying alert, if we're watching, if we're, if we're praying in the spirit, if we're making sure that we're on our guard, then that's going to prevent a lot of his ambushments. You know, uh, an undisciplined soldier in battle, a sluggish soldier, a soldier with dull senses in battle, um, he'll soon be sent home in a body bag. You know, it's the soldiers that are alert in battle that have the most, the best chance of making it through the battle in victory. Alertness is defined as a state of active attention characterized by high sensory awareness. Someone who is alert is vigilant and promptly meets danger or emergency or is quick to perceive and act. So, you know, they have those tests even like when you're driving, your reaction time. Like you see something pop up and, and they, there's tests like that on the computer, I know, where it's like you have, you, you see something pop up and you have to hit a button and however fast you respond to that button is how fast your sensory awareness is and how quick you are to act. Some people have a very slow reaction time. It's like they see something and you can almost like count to 10 before it's like, oh, there's something going on and I should act to it. In, in, in some cases, that you can't take your time. You gotta be ready to act in a moment, but you gotta be ready to act the right way. You know, you can't, you can't have your reaction be the wrong thing. You know, okay, so you see something pop up and in, or say you're driving and there's a car that starts coming out. So you react by turning the wheel and turning into the driver. Well, that's not the right, re you reacted, but it's not the right reaction. You want your reaction to get you out of danger, not put you into more danger. Um, but the, this, uh, another, another definition of at alertness is to be mentally responsive and perceptive. You know, we talk about perception all the time and being um, like the sons of Issachar. The sons of Issachar is a good example of alertness. They, were, they, they, were, they knew the times that they lived in and they knew what they had to do. They were prepared and they were ready to act at a moment's notice. Um, it also, alertness is also brisk or lively in action. You know, they have some pep to their step, not just sluggishly trudging through life. That's not, that's not alertness. Um, other words, synonyms for alertness are aware, cognizant, conscious, sensible, awake, alert, watchful, vigilant. What you don't hear in that is sleepy or sluggish or dull. You know, that's not how we should be in life. We got to be alert. We got to be active. You know, when Gideon was preparing to attack the Midianites, we all are familiar with the story of Gideon. The Lord had directed him to reduce the number of troops. Um, and the first round was get rid of everybody who's afraid. Can't have fear on the battle. You, you got to get rid of the fear first. But then that number was still too large. So Yahweh told him to put them through this test. And at first glance, it's an interesting test. And you can say, what does this have to do with anything? Brings them down to the water and says, those who get down on their knees and, and lap like a dog, you know, put them aside. And those who grab the water in their hands and bring it up to their mouth, put them on, on one side. And everyone who got down on their knees and was lap were lapping the water like a dog, they sent home. Why is that? What, 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 was, what did that have anything to do with their readiness for battle? Well, when they're getting down on their knees to drink, their whole focus is on the water, 
on satisfying their thirst. I'm so thirsty, I need to drink this water. They're, they would be totally unaware of any enemy soldiers that are coming up on them. They would be to, they're taking their eyes off of the focus of the battle. And I got I to gotta satisfy this need in my flesh right now. But those who, who, who brought the water up to their mouth, they're, they're, they're keeping their eyes constantly on the alert, scanning for danger, scanning for, another, for soldiers coming. They were alert. Even though they were, yes, water is a necessity. You got to drink water. But they didn't put that above their, their first priority as a soldier, to be alert. Um, you know, like I said with Israel, Israel has to be alert. The, and being in Israel at this time was an interesting time because Israel's at war. And, and in, in most of the places where, where we went, you really didn't get the sense of them being at war. Um, there was a sense of like great shalom over the areas where we were at. But there was one place where we went and it was Hebron. And I'm, for anybody who's been here, who has been with us to Hebron, you know that Hebron's an interesting place. Um, when I first went to Hebron, I was 10 years old, and it was in the early 2000s. It was still during the Second Intifada. There was a lot of activity going on around in Hebron. Um, and, and, and my first memory of Hebron is us pulling, us pulling up in our bulletproof bus, you know, into this little narrow street, and we were supposed to go into this little, like, gift shop area. And our tour guide... Ronnie had gotten out of the bus and he said to us, you guys get out of the bus, go straight into the building. Don't stop in the street. Do not, don't hesitate. Just literally get out of the bus, go into the building. He had his weapon drawn and he was scanning all the, all the windows above us. Why? Because there were snipers all over the place. There are snipers in the, in the buildings who would be looking for an opportunity to get in an attack. So that's not the place where you want to just start wandering around and saying, oh, hey, I think I'm going to take a picture out here, fully exposed in the middle of the street, selfie, selfie with the snipers. You know, that's not a, not a good idea. Um, but, ooh, <laughs> made the power crackle there. <laughs> that's why it's not a good idea. Um, but so that was my introduction to Hebron. So needless to say, anytime I go to Hebron, there's kind of like that, memory in the back of my mind. Hebron's calmed down a lot over the years, but it's still probably one of the more heightened areas. It's one of the areas, I was saying this to mom, you step into Hebron and you can feel the spiritual battle the most. Um, Hebron is a, is a Jewish community of about 800 people that are surrounded by about 250,000 um, Muslims, Palestinian Muslims, who are great supporters of Hamas and would love to see October 7th happen many times over. So, except it's not like Gaza, where they're on the other side of a fence and they're over there. This is literally a city like Fitchburg. So it'd be like this neighborhood around the church, and then beyond that is all Hamas. So they have to have guards stationed. And, you know, the world will go and take pictures and say, oh, the, these bad Israelis shut down this, line, this row of... Palestinian shops and, and they're so terrible. They're treating them so badly. No, you know why they shut down the shops? Because they, they were was terrorists that were operating out of those shops. They had to shut down the shops and they have the rest of the city that they can do whatever they want to do in. But when we're going through Hebron now, there's, there's, there's always soldiers and police and guards that are posted pretty much at every intersection around. And so we had to walk from point A to point B down the street and up into a neighborhood, which again, 20 years ago, we would not have even been able to do that. You don't walk through Hebron back then. So it's, it's safe enough now that we can walk, but our, our group leader had given an instruction, everybody stay together as a group. You know, just in the natural, who is it that the enemy tries to pick out? Um, it's those who are hanging around the edges. The stragglers, if you're by yourself, if you're, you're way behind the group, you know, when the wolves are coming after a flock, they don't go after the center of the flock. They go after the, the old ones, the sick ones, the little ones that are on the edges, those who are wandering from the flock. So the instruction is to stay together as a group. Stay together as a group and we're going to be fine. Well, 
How many of you know the, te the tendency of human nature is to not listen to instructions that are given clearly and multiple times? And you always have a couple, at least, that are going to wander and do their own thing. And so <laughs> we're going through this, this neighborhood in Hebron. And, and because, because I've had the experience there, I was like, I'm going to just play the cattle dog and just kind of try to surround this group from behind. And there's a couple others, so we're kind of like, like trying to keep everybody together. But then you have the selfie takers who like to step out into the middle of the road and, and, and we're going to take a picture and, oh, I got to take a picture of this. And one almost gets hit by a car because the car comes flying around the road. It's like you're in a, you're in a, a main street. You just don't, don't do that. So our time there was constantly, let's catch up to the group. Come on, let's come. Come on, you, you don't be stopping in the middle of the road to take, take a picture. Let's go and catch up with the group. And there's just an unawareness. And you could tell that they're not even like, alert to anything around them, just in their own world. And it's like, the, I am looking at that and I'm like, it's frustrating when you have people like that because it's like, not only are you putting yourself in an unnecessary position of danger, but now you're putting others because now we have to hang back with you apart from the rest of the group to make sure that you're okay. And, and so it's like, okay, I think they finally got the picture when our our main tour guide brought us up to this one little place where we could like look in the windows of the uh, of the next neighborhood over and he was like that right there that is a that's a Hamas stronghold and they're watching us and and you know in in there that I noticed the group stayed a lot tighter together after that point because somehow they were like oh maybe maybe we better stay together but the point is 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 alertness you got to be alert in places like that. Not afraid, not, oh my gosh, there might be something around that corner and, and, and constantly like that. No, alertness is not about being afraid. Alertness is about being aware of your surroundings. How many times do we tell our children that? Be aware of your surroundings. Don't walk forward and look behind you. You're going to walk into a wall. You know, don't be trying, don't be looking at me while you're going and doing something. And how many times do they run into walls? And we say, you should have listened to me and paid attention to your surroundings. But how many times do we do that as an adult? Maybe we don't walk into a wall, but we might walk into a situation that Holy Spirit was trying to have us to avoid because he was telling us to just be aware of our surroundings. Pay attention. Be alert. Be aware of what the enemy has pl planned for you. Don't get caught off guard. Same thing when we were out in some of the vineyards and, and they told us, Everything's, everything's safe in this area, but you know what? Don't rely on others to watch out for you. You know, don't get so caught up in what you're doing that you're not aware of anything going on around. Every now and then look up from your picking grapes. Every now and then look up and see, just check, check the horizon, you know? It's always a good idea, regardless of where you are. Doesn't matter, matter whether you're in Israel, doesn't matter, matter whether you're in Fitchburg. Pay attention to your surroundings is, a, is wise advice for all of us. Um, but, you know, when, when, you're, when you get to the point of soldiers on a battlefield, um, vigilance is necessary. It is necessary to life. You know, um, in Ezekiel, um, Yahweh speaks to Ezekiel and tells him, I've called you to be a watchman and, and go and stand there and tell us what you see. A watchman has to be alert. Um, they can't get so um, lulled by the dullness of their job. You know, they could be standing there for, for hours and they might see a, you know, a rabbit go across. And, you know, they, they could be standing there for hours and nothing's going on. And sometimes that's exactly when people let their guard down and say, well, nothing's going on. I, I don't have to pray right now. I don't have to read my Bible right now. No, everything's calm for now, so I, I, I don't need to do it. But you need to always be doing it because you don't know when the enemy is going to launch a strike. Um, and so I came across this article that's talking about this, um, this man who is on a convoy escort team. So they're, they're, they're responsible for, for tra security to convoys that are traveling between Iraq and Kuwait. 
So you don't just have your convoy of, of soldiers going, you have to have someone surrounding them um, as security. And his responsibility is to be watching the roads and fields for threats. He's sitting on a one foot by um, one foot board, th one foot by three foot board covered with a thin layer of padding, manning his, manning his rifle. And that's his job, to just watch. And he said that it can be, you know, he's, he's got to be looking for anything that could be jeopardizing the mission of, of, of the entire troop. It could be something as small as potholes in the road. It could be a roadside bomb. It could be anything that's going on. But you got to be alert. And he said that his, the, the, the only thing is when they're going and they're going on these drives, the constant drone of the vehicles driving can cause their eyes to get heavy. You know, as, the, as they're going, you ever been on a long road trip? Even not in a war zone, but just going on a road trip. You ever notice after a few hours, suddenly the lines start to blur in the middle of the road? And it's like the, the miles, as they drag on, it can lull you. It can start to make you get sleepy. You see signs all over the place now that say, you know, take a break, stay awake for safety's sake. You know, there's a reason they have that out there. You don't want to fall asleep when you're driving. That can be dangerous. But for these men, they can't fall asleep because there's dangers in the fields. There's dangers on the road. They're responsible for the safety of all these troops. And so... Uh, they're taught how to do this. They're, 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 they go through rigorous training. They go through um, simulation exercises so that they know how to respond to these things. But that in and of itself is not good enough. Like she said, you can have a plan, but a plan is not the same as being prepared. And it's not the same as being alert. You know, you can, you, I could have a plan for going to Israel but if I didn't get my stuff together, if I didn't book my tickets, then I'm not going to Israel. You know, I, I can plan all I want, but there has to be action put behind the plan. And the action is being alert and it's being prepared. And so, so these, these men uh, in, who, who have to work on the battlefield, they have to do things to keep themselves alert, to keep themselves awake in these times. Um, but then also, every soldier is also responsible for the protection of their unit. Every soldier cannot let down their guard because they say, well, that person's the watchman for today, so I don't even have to pay attention. No, every person. You know, you see something from your perspective that he might miss. You know, it, even, even when you're traveling, they have these signs that say, if you see something, say something. We can so rely on the security around us, but, but without realizing or stopping to think of the fact that the security themselves are humans who can miss things. If you see something, say something. If you see something that's out of place, say something. We were coming back from, uh, from Israel in Boston. Um, there was a backpack that was left unattended outside the, the airport. So I went in and reported it to the, to the, the authorities. There's police all over the place. Is it likely that somebody probably just left their backpack and forgot it? Yeah, but you say something. Traveling to Hebron um, on our on our trip, um, one of the one of the leaders was was talking and all that. In midstream talking, he's looking he's looking out at the uh, road ahead of us. Midstream talking, he st stops and turns to our bus driver and says, "There was a water tank sitting by the side of an intersection." Not entirely something we would give any thought to, but in Israel, a water tank is very unusual to be sitting by the side of an intersection, and considering the area we were in, it's possible it could have been a bomb. So you call that in and report it to the authorities. But the bus driver used that as an example to point out to all of us, see how alert he is? Even though he's talking to us, he's telling us about where we're going, he's doing all this, his eyes are scanning all around. He's always alert. So we got to be alert. The enemy is, is just like that, just trying to plant something in our, in our path. And we got to make sure that we are aware of our surroundings. So as we're coming through this month of Elul, as we're coming closer to the high holidays, 
we got to make sure that not only are we prepared, not only are we ready for the coming of the king, but we're alert to the signs of the times. You know, the signs of the times are all around us. And sometimes people can get so caught up in looking for a particular prophecy to come to pass that they're completely not even seeing all the prophecy that is happening around them, all the signs of the time that are happening all around them. And all these things are pointing to the fact that Yeshua is coming soon. Just like, just like the wise virgins, the, the five wise and the five foolish, like she said, it wasn't the fact that, you know, the, the um, five foolish virgins, it wasn't the fact that they fell asleep. All of them fell asleep. But the wise ones were ready at an instant notice to act. And they were prepared. They had everything they needed to be able to carry out their mission. We got to make sure that as we're walking through these, these times, that we're not caught off guard, that we're, that we're not failing to put the things into place in our lives that Holy Spirit's telling us to put into place. You know, there's things, we said this a few weeks ago, there's things that Holy Spirit has been more, talking and speaking to each of us on, and we can't afford to be saying, well, I'm, he's dealing with me on that, or I'm working on it. We, we got to do it now. We got to put it in place now. There's a reason why he's telling you to prepare for it. There's a reason why he's telling you to change this thing in your life or to get this thing out or to add this thing into your life. There's a reason. There's a reason why before you, you go on a trip, like, uh, like she said, with mom telling us to drink more water, there's a reason why they tell you if you're going to be going on a trip, start building up your immune system beforehand. How many people... When they go to go to something, they'll bring, you know, bring stuff along and all that. How many people, when they start to get sick, will start to take something for it? Which, fine, that's better than never taking anything. Better thing is to take it beforehand so that your immune system is already ready to deal with it, ready to handle it. Because by, by the time you're already fighting something, then it's a lot harder to get up on top of it than if you're ready ahead of time. It's like building your house in the, in the middle of a hurricane. Is it possible? Yeah, but it's a lot harder than if you just had the foundation laid and the walls up beforehand. There's preparation that you do for anything in life, whether it be storms coming, whether it be trips you're going to take, positive or negative, there's preparation that needs to be put into place in life. And that the same thing goes for spiritually. So as we come closer, and we are getting ever closer, I think it's only, what, two weeks away that, we're, that Yom Teruah is? And it's not insignificant that Pastor George had declared this fast, uh, again, during this, this period of time, to strip off the things that might be weighing us down, to, to clear off the noise off of our line so that we can hear Holy Spirit better. And so that we can know what we need to do so that we're prepared to move with him. When he tells us to step up, when he tells us to, to go here, when he tells us to do this, we're ready to hear and we're ready to obey. And it all comes from practice. Amen? Have anything else? Well, thank you for those of you who joined us today on Facebook. Trust you've gotten something out of this message. We'll see you on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Until then, you have a blessed week.